I'm sorry, introduce Rob Addington. Rob is a uh, research associate with the Colorado Forest Re Restoration Institute. Um, Rob received a master's degree in plant biology and BS degrees in biology and English. So he doesn't have the same excuses as the rest of us for poor um, yeah. communication. <laughs> so uh, let's See. welcome Rob. Okay, morning everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here, very excited to be here, and want to begin with a big thanks to uh, the organizers of the workshop. It's been, been great, it's been a great meeting for me. Special thanks to Darren and Mike and uh, all the student organizers, especially Jamie, who I interacted with a good bit um, over the last few months before, uh, before the workshop here. And I want to give a very special thanks to Dr. Jerry Franklin here um, not only for being here and giving such a wonderfully inspiring talk yesterday afternoon, but also just for uh, your contribution to the field. Um, Dr. Franklin worked with uh, my old advisor in the southeast. Um, I've spent most of my career up to this point in Longleaf Pine um, in the southeast, and Dr. Franklin worked with my advisor, uh, Dr. Bob Mitchell. And that system really kind of working out some of the the principles of uh, ecological forestry and, and applying them to that system in particular. Um, and Dr. Franklin's work has certainly influenced me over the years, and I think that'll be pretty obvious in what I'm going to be talking about today. And I hope you don't interpret this as me ripping you off. I hope you <laughs> interpret it more as a, a, a compliment um, uh, to your work. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is... Uh, uh, an effort that we're undertaking on the Front Range of Colorado um, is kind of stemming from some uh, restoration work that's been going on over the last decade, um, really focused on moving kind of from uh, principles to practice um, in designing, implementing restoration treatments. Um, and I will begin with uh, a little bit of an introduction to the Front Range, um, some of the, uh, the context that surrounds the restoration situation on the Front Range. We'll go through some guiding principles, not too unlike what we heard yesterday from, from Dr. Franklin, and then we'll describe a little bit about an implementation framework um, that we're attempting to develop to actually move from principles to, uh, to the practice. Um, so, as I'm sure most of you are familiar, the Colorado Front Range is uh, this area in Colorado representing kind of a fairly dramatic and abrupt transition from the plains to the Rocky Mountains. Let's see here, there we go. Um, right here, it, it includes a 10 county area from the south. Um, Teller and El Paso counties to the north, up in Larimer County near Fort Collins. Metro areas including Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, um, Boulder, Fort Collins. Over four million people, a lot of folks live in this area. So it's uh, very important. Um, in terms of natural landscape, uh, over 4.2 million acres of forested land anchored by a couple of national forests the Arapaho Roosevelt in the north and the Pike San Isabel in the south and of course Rocky Mountain National Park um, in the north. Uh, all of that kind of shown in the green here. Um, and a good bit of that forest is ponderosa pine, um, dry forest type that's represented by this kind of lime green color here, uh, mainly in the lower elevation settings. And uh, you can see with this sort of vertical depiction, change in forest composition with elevation. Um, the lower montane drier forest zone is really kind of 5,500 to 8,000, 
feet roughly in elevation where you begin to transition more into a kind of a wet mixed conifer on up into lodgepole um, subalpine fine, subalpine forest and then on up into alpine tundra from there. So as you probably know, we've been in the news a good bit in the last few years. Um, between the, the big wildfires in 2012, the, um, the High Park fire near Fort Collins, the Waldo Canyon fire near Colorado Springs, um, and of course more recently, the, uh, the floods that took place. Um, to me, this highlights really the important relationship between the communities and the people that live on the Front Range and the natural environment. Um, it highlights the risks, it highlights our vulnerabilities, I think. Um, and a lot of what has happened is not too inconsistent with some of the, uh, the predictions around global change and what we may need to uh, sort of come to expect over in, in the future. Um, and in particular, some of the implications of global change for the front range. Um, climate change obviously being a big factor. And I think most of the models agree now that increases in temperatures should be expected. Um, a little less certainty around precipitation trends. Uh, we may be a little wetter in the future. We may stay the same. Um, there is some indication that the ch there may be a change in the distribution of precipitation from um, snow to more rain. Um, it coming at different times of the year and uh, in different ways, kind of explained by Simon yesterday with potentially m more extreme events um, rather than sort of slow and steady throughout the year. Um, earlier snow melt is one thing that is uh, of concern. Um, less snowpack at lower elevations in particular. Um, earlier spring snow melt that would contribute then to um, earlier peak flows in, uh, in some of the, the streams and rivers. Um, a general sort of shift, I think, or migration of climate upward from lower elevation to uh, higher elevation. And accompanying that shift some uh, potential change in vegetation patterns. So potential movement of drought adapted species like ponderosa pine upslope, um, potential loss of some of those dry forest types at lower elevation um, and a transition from those forest types more towards uh, shrubland or grassland at lower elevation. Um, speculation around insects and disease um, potentially becoming worse uh, in particular, I think, um, the uh, reproductive capability of mountain pine beetle being favored by um, warmer temperatures and so some expansion in that potentially. Uh, some indication that sudden aspen decline may uh, become worse with um, the drier condition as well, especially at lower elevation. Um, of course, invasive species being an issue around global change. And a big one for us is the wildland urban interface and the uh, expansion of that which is going to be inevitable. This area uh, is one of the fastest growing areas in the country and um, will continue to experience lots of growth and lots of expansion into um, forested areas. And with that comes fragmentation, which is, is, a, is a big concern, certainly. And then I'll end here with probably one of the more important things, fire. Um, I think beginning with Westerling's 2006 science paper um, documenting an increase in wildfire activity through, uh, throughout western states. Um, I think the expectation for the Front Range is similar. Um, more land area burned, longer fire seasons, um, potentially off-season fires, having fires in winter months when we might not uh, typically expect to have them. Um, and I want to highlight a few things about fire in particular because it does really shape the restoration situation on the Front Range. Um, and in particular, kind of this trend that we've seen towards larger high severity uh, wildfires in this area. Highlighted kind of in, in red over here, um, 
and the south being the Haman fire of 2002 on up to the north, which is the, uh, the High Park fire of 2012 there. Um, and it was really the Haman fire that kind of got people talking and got people concerned about uh, this issue of, of high severity, um, large scale wildfire. And this is a kind of a panorama of the Hayman area about 10 years after the burn. Um, so it was in 2002, this was I think in uh, 2012 um, that uh, this, this set of pictures was taken. Um, so this really kind of you know, represents, I think in this particular area, it was a, a 60,000 acre area of high severity fire, really sort of representing this uh, state transition from what was a forest to more of a, a grassland at this point. Um, so again, that particular event really kind of brought the community together and you know, said was it was really a kind of a, a call for action and uh, led to the formation in 2004 of the uh, Front Range Fuels Treatment Partnership Roundtable. Um, and in 2006, the publication of uh, this kind of seminal document for us, Living with Fire, which really is sort of the, the call to action and, and lays out some of the strategy for the restoration approach. And then more recently in 2010, um, the Front Range was the recipient of a CFLR, Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program grant, and that's really uh, helped advance a lot of the restoration work on the Front Range. Um, the effort is focused primarily, again, in this lower montane dry forest, ponderosa, dry mix conifer system. Um, again, roughly 5,500 to 8,000-ish or so feet. Um, some 1.5 million acres total that is within this area and uh, largely believed to be outside of its um, historic or, or natural range of variability um, with regard to forest densities, with regard to diversity, complexity, and uh, with regard to the native um, fire regimes that we think characterize these lower elevation settings. So we have kind of a general set of goals of you know, decreasing wildfire severity, increasing resistance to insects and disease, um, promoting forest health, uh, reducing threats to communities, watersheds, improving habitat for fish and wildlife. Um, and some general ideas and ways in which we may achieve these goals in terms of establishing a complex mosaic of forest structure at a stand and landscape scales, um, favoring drought tolerant species such as ponderosa pine or lower elevation species, um, trying to reestablish a more characteristic fire regime. Um, in essence, you know, what we want is a more resilient um, front range. And I, I like the, the definition that Dr. Brunson had up here earlier. Um, I think originating with Holling in the 1970s and refined by Brian Walker more recently that it really refers to uh, the ability of a system to absorb disturbance without a fundamental change in its structure, its function, its process, um, and its ability to provide uh, important values in ecosystem services, not only to human populations, but to wildlife. Um, so, you know, that's really the, the overarching goal of uh, what we're trying to achieve for our front range landscape. But how do we get there? That's, it's, it's been a challenge moving sort of from this generalized set of goals to uh, what this looks like on the ground. Um, and in particular, the development of more detailed desired conditions um, around restoration. And as we got started, I think, with some of this work, a lot of it was really focused on fuels reduction and uh, wildfire mitigation. And uh, in some cases, folks weren't as pleased with the outcomes of um, those approaches. And so some need to move beyond this uh, sort of singularly focused management objective to a, a more holistic approach. So how do we get there through collaboration and a lot of meetings? Um, and what I want to highlight are two processes that we've been uh, undertaking in the past uh, year. One 
what we call the GTR group, um, GTR referring to general technical report. Um, and this is kind of a sub-team of that larger front range uh, round table group aimed really at developing a, a science basis um, and guidelines for restoration. Not too unlike things that Jerry talked about yesterday and uh, his recently published field guide to uh, restoration of dry forest in eastern Oregon. Another model that we've been relying on is out of the Sierra Nevada by Malcolm North, um, the GTR 220 over there. And the other process being the Upper Monument Creek Collaborative, which has been organized and led by uh, the Nature Conservancy and uh, Paige Lewis in particular, and they've done a, a phenomenal job of bringing together a whole range of folks across agencies, organizations, um, and really trying to use a particular area to um, think about these principles and think about how we might apply them on the ground. And it's been just a wonderful case study and a wonderful uh, way of, of thinking through some of these things. And this is just a, a kind of a, a loose list of uh, the different groups that have been involved in this uh, initiative. Um, so to run through a few of the kind of key hypotheses or assumptions that are really framing our thinking around this, um, some of which was covered by Jerry yesterday, but we do think there is an importance to um, considering the historic range of variability as a guide, um, and in particular as a way of anticipating how systems may respond to future climate um, and uh, future change, uh, disturbance regimes and whatnot. So not being constrained by the historic condition, but rather using it as a, uh, as a guide for what we might expect. Um, we may need to be accepting of novel ecosystems if they do provide desirable values and, uh, and function for us, um, then uh, you know, we, if it's outside of that historic or natural range of variability, we may need to kind of um, consider those. Uh, enhancing heterogeneity will provide more options for adaptation under future climate con conditions. Um, treatment approaches that are mindful of ecological dynamics, such as uh, ecological forestry-based approaches, will uh, help us in enhancing this heterogeneity. And then, of course, uh, adaptive management providing a good framework for addressing the uncertainty that is uh, just so characteristic of the restoration project process. So with that sort of a, a foundation, we're kind of trying to develop a, um, a set of core concepts that we think are important and that we would like to uh, impart on um, managers as we're uh, beginning to think about how to design restoration treatments. One is just the, the concept of scale. What do we mean by scale? From plot scales, less than one acre, on up to landscape scales, greater than 10,000 acres. And what are the important components across those scales? At fine scales, we have individual trees. They may be arranged in groups. They may be out on their own. We have this important interspace between the trees. Um, at larger scales, we get into more of a kind of patch dynamics, forested patches versus unforested patches and the relationships of, of those to one another. Uh, we're trying to characterize heterogeneity, just describe it at, at a fine scale. We've um, come up with this depiction of density and dispersion along these axes. So in the upper right, a high density, uh, very uniform situation, and on the lower left, a low density clump situation. Um, out here on the right being a completely open area. That at fine scales, how does that roll up to a larger scale, stand scale, project scale, even a landscape scale? Um, it, these are sort of extreme examples, particularly the top one, but that upper right, if we had a whole bunch of that, this is kind of what it looks like on the, uh, the landscape. Um, under a more heterogeneous situation, it would, you'd have more of those, those uh, fine scale patterns throughout the, uh, the area that would result in this more heterogeneous pattern. And then understanding kind of the environmental uh, drivers of the heterogeneity, and in particular for us, uh, the underlying moisture gradients. Um, and changes in moisture that occur with elevation and aspect in particular, um, this being a, a topographic relative moisture index that we're attempting to make use of. 
And then, of course, interactions with disturbance regimes and fire being a big one. The, um, the fire regime in general on the Front Range is it's complex. It, it ranges from low severity at these lower elevations to mixed and high severity at higher elevations and in other areas with uh, higher moisture contents. So really kind of trying to get our heads around some of these natural dynamics. Um, additionally, considering ways in which trees die, the, the effects of tree mortality and patterns of uh, mortality on uh, structure and heterogeneity. Jim Lutz talked a lot about that yesterday, which was very informative. Um, the importance of biological legacies like old trees, dead trees, of course, woody debris. Um, the functional importance of some of these structures and then, as uh, Jerry mentioned yesterday, the uh, importance of restoring both structure and processes like fire. So moving from principles to practice, we're attempting to develop kind of an implementation framework, weaving these uh, concepts into the restoration process and kind of mirroring a, a forest planning or a NEPA process where we um, try and provide some relevance to the development of purpose and need statements, um, proposed actions, and treatment design criteria. So <clears throat> we're just kind of beginning with this process of developing kind of this multi-scaled uh, planning approach, which is aimed really at prioritizing landscapes and projects area, areas based on things such as these, obviously vegetation pattern and departure from a, a natural range of variability. Where might open forest structures be most appropriate on the landscape? Where might you want to leave uh, more dense forest structures? Um, opportunities for enhancing underrepresented features like old growth, for example. Wildlife habitat obviously being important, community protection. Prescribed fire use in particular, um, it would be wonderful if we could do more prescribed fire on the front range and anything that we can do to facilitate that I think is important. Uh, of course, uh, building from some of the recent wildfires that have occurred and then of course feasibility and efficiency. Um, and exploring the use of some of the decision support systems that are out there, um, a particularly intriguing one that I've come across recently is this ecosystem management decision support tool that, uh, that Jerry's been involved with, with uh, Paul Hesberg and others out of the Pacific Northwest. And then at the stand level, um, varying stand density according to topographic features. Um, this is meant to represent a ponderosa pine stand in red here. And uh, it's kind of embedded within a wet mixed conifer, dry mixed conifer situation. It provides a good opportunity for creating an open um, structured condition and the way in which you might do that is very density according to low density, high density, uh, medium density situations based on um, topographic variables. Uh, enhancing spatial structure, this fine scale mosaic that Jerry talked about yesterday, um, the ICO or individual trees, clumps of trees and openings and uh, retaining old trees, obviously being an important thing. Snags and coarse woody debris provide a lot of uh, structural complexity and important wildlife functions and it should be retained. And then real quick through these, age and size distribution being important, removing overrepresented age classes, species preferences, wildlife structures, uh, retaining and stru structures that are important for wildlife. Um, being aware of the, the understory and the value of the understory plant community and uh, trying to minimize damage to that and uh, really enhancing the response through prescribed fire if possible. And uh, riparian area protection and then just a recognition that you don't, within a, a stand or a treatment unit, don't need to treat every acre. There should be areas that are uh, left untreated or as reserves. And we're working on the development of some visualization tools for this. Um, I'm a big believer that pictures can often say a thousand words. This is meant to represent a, a kind of typical pretreatment condition. North facing slope on the left, south facing slope on the right. And post treatment, what that might look like in terms of varying density according to this elevational change and uh, enhancing this fine scale mosaic of individual trees. And then of course development of monitoring programs that are 
across scales and designed to assess this heterogeneity. That's a big challenge, something that we're working on. And then lastly, the uh, kind of loop ba back to adaptive management, so to speak, the importance of uh, this as a framing, um, a framework for us in recognizing uncertainty. This is a, a figure that Greg Applett developed for the Front Range, uh, Greg Applett and Peter Brown, um, that kind of takes us through this restoration process and then you can sort of see the different the feedback loops. So again, just to reiterate the importance. And the next steps from here, um, we are going to embark on a workshop process with uh, managers where we seek their feedback um, on some of these ideas and incorporate them prior to what hopefully will be the publication of a, a GTR, again, not too unlike some of uh, the models that I have provided up here. And a lot of people that have been involved in this effort that I want to acknowledge as I'm closing, um, Greg Applett being a big one, Mike Babbler with the Nature Conservancy, several Forest Service people, Mike Battaglia, Claudia Reagan, Jim Tennis, Jeff Underhill, um, Rick Truax, and a uh, special shout out to Paige Lewis for her work with the Upper Monument Creek Collaborative in particular and uh, the Nature Conservancy. And uh, with that, take any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you guys have a well thought out, you know, plan to restore the ecosystem, but and I assume it's going to involve a lot of widespread uh, burning and uh, more frequent burning. How do you educate or get those millions of people downwind to accept this practice and you know, to implement it? And I think that's something that you guys have to really look at towards the end to get that. Yeah. Public Absolutely. It's a very very good question, and uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges to what we're attempting to, to do here. It's one of the biggest needs, I think, restoring that fire as a process, and obviously prescribed fire as how we would like to see that happen. Um, I think the hope is that we can embark on more of a public outreach process and gain some acceptance for prescribed fire, uh, more so than currently exists, unfortunately. Um, I think our sort of worst case sort of fallback scenario is to hope anyway that we may be able to kind of set these systems up in a way so that if we do have a natural ignition and a wildfire that that situation can be managed for ecological benefit um, in some ways. So that being kind of another another tier, I guess, to the strategy, but, but uh, ideally anyway, um, prescribed fire and we're kind of proceeding with that, with that hope, and are going to do you know, everything we can to, to uh, do outreach and, and hope to begin instituting it on a larger scale than what we've seen up to now. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's a, it's an excellent point. And it's, um, I think it's an area that is very ripe for research and further investigation. And people have, uh, have thought about it, and I think there's some initial work sort of aimed in that direction. And we have some of the more recent wildfires, like the High Park Fire and parts of the Waldo Canyon Fire, have been um, fairly heterogeneous in nature and, and would provide some opportunity for, for doing that sort of thing in kind of a, an experimental setting. So I do think it is a, an important um, component to this and, and just your general point about the need to sort of validate some of this, it, it points to our uncertainty in, in a lot of these and again the need for adaptive management and approaching this with uh, innovation and uh, uh, a spirit of uh, experimentation, I guess, and trying to really design management treatments as experiments to the extent that we can. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. So. <laughs>
Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, using different scales for the visual level you're working on. I'm particularly interested in whether you can attach scale to the mesh landscape level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we debated a good bit about um, how best to discuss scale. We knew that it was uh, an important thing to talk about, um, but we weren't exactly sure how best to uh, package and present it. And what we kind of decided on, we went with these things that we felt like were relevant to um, land managers, thinking about the plot scale being this kind of fine scale, stand scale being a, a, an operational unit, something that is familiar um, to, to managers, certainly, and then on up to a project and landscape level. Um, and so from there, we then you know, tried to identify those important uh, components that accompanied each of those scales, as I mentioned, from individual trees at that fine scale and openings to the larger sort of patch dynamics at, at the larger scales. Um, and I think we're, there are a lot of unknowns about our desired condition, particularly at that landscape scale and the arrangement of patches. Um, the, I think we're, we're better at defining what we don't want than what we do want. We know we don't want continuous uniform canopy cover. Um, we do want some breakup of that something that will prevent the spread of contagious disturbance processes like wildfire and like uh, insects and disease. But um, the exact nature, the exact arrangement of those patches sort of in time and space, again, is going to be another adaptive management uh, sort of uh, experiment, I think, for us. Um, but I think it's, it's useful thinking across those scales in part because we we want to measure success at that larger landscape scale, but our treatments really are more at, say, a stand or, or project level. And so kind of having some understanding of the relationships of across scales and then how that larger landscape context should inform our uh, treatment level um, approaches, I think, is important. So not sure if that really gets at your question exactly, but <laughs> that's, those are my thoughts on scale anyway. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks.